Alright everybody, welcome back to We Play Games. I'm Walker and here we are in how to use corn laws in 1.3. So in 1.3 there's been a pretty meaningful change to corn laws. Now you have to get your grain price up to 25% over, but there are ways that you can accomplish that and I'm going to show you what sort of strategies you need to, to use to grow the price of your grain in different sized markets here. But before we jump in on that, I think it's important that we have a conversation about corn laws themselves as a historical object. So between 1815 and 1846, Great Britain had some pretty strict laws on the importation of corn, which was cereal grains, things like wheat and barley. And what this meant was that if there were ever food shortages within the nation, that poor people would starve. They literally could not afford food and the prices on importation, because first they had like a strict limit on pr how low the price was allowed to go, and then they moved over to a tariff structure. But in both cases, it basically made it impossible for the nation to bring food in when there was a food shortage. And for those of you who are familiar with the history of Great Britain, you'll know that 1846 is the very, very beginning of the Irish famine. So this is a, a really critical time period in, in Great Britain. And it is one of these things where you can think, why would the landowners do this sort of thing? Why would they be in favor of corn laws being repealed? Because when food prices are really high, the people who own land where food is produced make a lot of money. That's exactly why they were passed in the first place. It's because the government feared a, a food riot. If you know human history, you know that basically food riots, they don't always stop at food riots and sometimes become revolutions. We think about, you know, France and the French Revolution, but don't think that it starts and stops there. Like the number of dynasties in China that have collapsed due in part to food scarcity problems, you cannot count on your hands. And so the food problem within Great Britain was getting pretty catastrophic in 1846, and so Robert Peel broke from the Conservative Party Party helped the Whigs pass the repeal of corn laws, and ultimately Great Britain became sort of like a, a haven for free trade due to their emphasis on reducing tariffs. And that's what corn laws sort of represents, but it means that you need to intentionally provoke a situation where you might have a food riot. That's your goal if you're trying to get corn laws passed, is you're not actually trying to help out your standard of living initially, you're trying to hurt it. You're trying to squeeze people to the point where the people start getting angry enough that the landowners are forced to make concessions. All right, so that out of the way, let's talk about how to introduce corn laws as a small nation. Here we're playing this Haiti, but you can do this with basically any sort of nation that doesn't start with an enormous number of pops available to them. The number of pops that you have available scales into how many people you can pull out of peasantry, because peasants in a small country are going to be the people who are mostly responsible for making your grain. And so if you can reduce the number of peasants, you'll increase your grain price. So what does that mean? It means building things. But unsurprisingly, it's not just anything. As a small nation, I think the easiest way to get your grain price as high as possible is to try to build some logging camps, some livestock ranches, and some construction sectors. If you need to start importing iron so that you can build tooling workshops and introduce tools to your logging camps, do so. But I would actually stay away from exploiting iron if you're a small nation like Haiti, because the construction cost is much higher. You really just need to get peasants off of main farms and doing literally anything else in order to increase the price of grain. And so things like logging camps and livestock ranches are actually very, very helpful because A, they can use tools so that can help you start to build up an industrial society because you're going to want to do that. You're going to need a tooling workshop no matter what. But the early loop, because we didn't get this tooling workshop online until, I don't know, like a year or two ago, the early loop of livestock ranches and logging camps are both very inexpensive. Each of these is only 150 construction points. And if you can't afford butchering tools or something like that, it's not catastrophic because livestock ranches are it's at least helpful for you. They're going to give you access to more fabric, which is going to reduce the cost of your construction. Logging camps similarly give you more wood, reduce the cost of your construction. But the reason that you want to be introducing a construction sector as like just a size one wooden construction sector as early as possible as literally everybody is because of the way this interacts with your investment pool. You want to get investment pool money rolling into your economy as quickly as possible as a small nation. So that way you just get more construction 
down. If the construction builds some tobacco or whatever, that's okay, because it's giving more money to the aristocrats. And in the short term, while you are growing your economy and trying to switch into corn laws, having a powerful landowner is a good thing, because the landowner is going to give you the clout necessary to pass the laws that corn laws are giving you. So here, if we were to play Haiti forward, it might even make sense for us to intentionally build some agricultural things, like maybe these coffee plantations or sugar plantations, just to buff the landowner in a short period of time. But that's something that you need to dial into your economy. As I said, if you want to import iron from someone, that's usually a good idea. But before you get into corn laws, your bureaucracy is pretty limited, and so you're not going to be able to support a large number of trade routes. I would say prioritize things that help out your growth more than anything else. Literally all you need to do in order to accomplish this is wood and fabric. You can do this with a lot of different nations. And of course, by increasing the amount of wood and fabric in your local economy, you are going to make the investment pool more interested in trying to build textile mills or furniture manufactories and therefore continue your industrial revolution. All right, so that out of the way, let's see how to accomplish corn laws as a larger nation. Here we have a game with Sicily where we accomplished corn laws in 1842. How did we accomplish corn laws in 1842? Well, you know, if you're playing a larger nation in Victoria 3, really anything starting with even Japan can accomplish this. Just build a navy at the very, very beginning of the game and plan to attack Great Qing whenever the, uh, the British attack them. If you're not strong enough to actually naval invade Taiwan itself, in this case, Sicily's is. But if you're like Japan or whatever, and you start with literally zero navy, you will not fill your, your flotillas fast enough to be able to naval invade. But if you naval invade Lanfang, and you choose as your war goal, liberate Lanfang, and then you take war reps from Great Qing as a secondary war goal, and you actually are able to land in Lanfang, you can usually get Great Qing to capitulate for just war reps when they get down to zero war support. It kind of depends on how many radicals they have and how bad their war was with Great Britain, but if they lose catastrophically, I've seen them be willing to give war reps to me consistently by naval invading Lanfang, even if you can't land on it on Taiwan. That said, if you can get like a size 50 15 Navy by the time that you're fighting Great Qing, you can just take a treaty port in Taiwan because their troops when they're fighting Great Britain are not going to be stationed there. And so you just need to beat the, uh, the Navy. And if you got a size 15 with a reasonable commander, you will definitely be able to sneak past the Qing flotillas and seize Takao. But why is that so important? Well, it's because you got to build stuff that it's the same thing that it is with a smaller nation. But when you're a larger nation, it means that the wheel of your your price on your grain is much, much harder to turn. Not the least of which because as you build your economy and make it bigger, you're going to need to introduce more construction into your economy. That construction will identify, hey, the price of wheat is really high, I should build some wheat farms. It can be trying to swim upriver if you're not bringing in foreign money in the form of diplopacts. But you don't have to get Great Qing war reps. You can try to get war reps from France or Russia if you find that you're strong enough to do that. But you, in order to accomplish an early corn laws, you almost certainly certainly need to get war reps from someone as a larger nation, but you're big. Go out there and get them. But once you've done that, you still need to keep in mind that your main goal is to just build peasants away. And so what this means is that I think the 1.3 meta is actually meaningfully different. I've spent probably six months complaining about how bad agricultural buildings are, but in reality, because of this change, because of the introduction of the 25% threshold, now agricultural buildings are good in the beginning of the game. They only cost 150 construction and they get people out of peasantry. Normally, I would be wary about building a bunch of agricultural stuff without access to automatic irrigation because they really are way, way, way less effective in terms of their employment. But having a bunch of laborers isn't the end of the world because of the, the long-term payoff of corn laws. And so if you have to build some cotton plantations or sugar plantations or silk plantations or whatever as a larger nation in order to accomplish corn laws, do so. But I would encourage you very, very strongly to focus in on things that are going to make your industries cheaper moving forward. So building stuff like sugar plantations to help out your food industries is much better than trying to build tea plantations, for instance. I 
think cash cropping as a small country can make sense, but as a large country, don't ever do it. Just build your industrial stuff. But what if you are playing as Japan or, or whatever, right? Playing as Japan, this is probably going to surprise nobody. I think the best way to start a Japan campaign is to attack Great Britain for recognition, have them demand that you open your market and back down. But I do recommend that you do that after your war with Great Qing, because as Japan, you really do need as many resources as you can get. And isolation does give you a pretty big bonus to your tax capacity. In the very, very beginning of the game, you just need to go ham on building up your navy as quickly as possible so you can attack Great Qing. But once you've done that and you've taken either a treaty port or you've taken some war reps, then I think you attack Great Britain and get them to open your market. And from there, you can kind of play the same way as uh, any sort of larger nation. But be aware that the bigger your economy is, the more that you can support the construction of iron mines. You do want to prioritize things that are relatively inexpensive in terms of construction points, just to maximize the speed at which you can get to 25% food cost. But if you need to introduce just like a little bit of extra demand, you can use trade routes. Be aware though that trade routes are not going to be very effective at trying to get rid of extra grain and a really big economy because these are not going to grow, right? These are unproductive trade routes. They're being supported by the productive trade routes that we have. And so they're not like causing our trade centers to decline and vanish. But because they're actually losing the trade center money, the trade center is not going to increase this, this grain export. Therefore, sending out grain is actually pretty ineffective at trying to utilize corn laws. It just depends on the size of your economy. And then if you're just like a real sadist, you could play as a, a nation that doesn't have wood but if you don't have wood then you kind of just trade for it there's really no other way around it if you don't have wood and you have a really really big economy you could potentially trade for iron instead of wood but I would recommend just keeping your production pretty low but one thing that you can do of course is swap over to iron frame buildings temporarily build up an input good shortage and then switch back and that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of spending extra money so it's very expensive expensive in terms of capital, but it allows you to transform that extra money into a lot of construction very fast. But once you've accomplished the increased price of grain and you've managed to get your corn laws journal entry going, then it makes sense to go ahead and do whatever you can to decrease the price of grain. You don't want the price of grain to be at 25% forever. That will do a number on your SOL. But if you have to trade for it or build a wheat farm or two, it's not the end of the world. But yeah, that's uh, that's accomplishing corn laws in Vicky 3 and 1.3. I think you definitely definitely can get it in the 1840s with most nations. With larger nations that start with isolationism, it can be pretty difficult. But there's a really, really important change here. It means that you can't jump in on a larger nation's market until you accomplish corn laws. Once you have your market liberal in hand and you've placed them in charge of the landowner, which, you know, you still have to wait for the meantime to happen to come up. But once you've got that in place, then you definitely can jump in on a bigger market if there's somebody interested in picking you up. But it means that the strategy of just immediately joining a great power, taking their guns, and conquering the world. It's not worse than corn laws, but it, it is incompatible. You have to do one or the other. All right, that's, uh, that's Walker. And that's how to accomplish corn laws in 1.3. I think we're going to do a stream of accomplishing corn laws with somebody in, in the near to immediate future. But, but I just want to get this video out because I know there are going to be some people who are struggling with accomplishing corn laws. And I do think it is still very, very powerful in, in 1.3. All right, that's Walker. Take care.